One of my wife's favorite TV shows of the past few years is that show, Breaking Bad. Any other fans of Breaking Bad out there? You can be honest. Be honest. Yeah, I knew it. Uh, you might know this show. If you don't, uh, the series, it lasted five years. It tells the story of struggling chemistry professor Walter White, who, as you can tell, was just diagnosed with lung cancer. And in order to secure his family's financial future, he uses his chemistry skills to uh, produce and distribute crystal meth with the aid of a former student, Jesse Pinkman. Now, Breaking Bad won countless awards, 16 Emmys. It is considered by many the best television show of all time. It's ranked by Guinness Book of World Records as the highest rated television show ever. Uh, audiences who like the show a lot can look forward to a spinoff. Next year, there's actually also a Breaking Bad opera in the works. And if you're a Spanish speaker, there's a Spanish version of the show in productions called Metastasis, starring Diego Trujillo as Walter Blanco. <laughs> now, in explaining the genesis of the show, uh, the creator of the show, uh, Vince Gilligan, uh, said that he wanted to write a show in which the protagonist is the antagonist, in which the hero is, is the anti-hero. But Breaking Bad is not the only show with a bad guy playing the lead. There are plenty of other shows out there, Dexter, Mad Men, The Sopranos. They all feature very, very complex anti-heroes uh, playing the lead, and it's hard like, not to root for them. In general, these types of shows are very popular these days. Good guys aren't that popular anymore. Bad guys are all the rage. But while there are a lot of anti-hero shows out there, Breaking Bad is clearly the most popular. And its popularity seems to come from what the title describes. Audiences get to see in painful detail how a good man breaks bad. Audiences get to watch, and they get a front row seat to watch and see how a family-oriented chemistry teacher becomes a murderous drug kingpin. Now, I actually think that's an interesting concept. And I think that's an interesting question of how exactly a good person breaks bad. But I think a better question, and even a more important question, isn't necessarily how a good man breaks bad. That's easy. We see that happen all the time, how good people turn bad. I think a much more important question and a much more relevant question is the opposite, how a bad person breaks good. How does God take drug kingpins and turn them into chemistry professors? How does God take sinners and addicts and losers like you and I and turn us into good people full of joy and peace and truth? That's a tougher question. That's a more interesting television show. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. As Jeremy said, we are in week three of our current series here at Rooftop. It's called The Fruit of the Spirit. The series is based on a really short passage in Galatians. And as we've established over the course of the past couple of weeks here, uh, Galatians is a book written by a guy by the name of Paul, an early first century Christian missionary and author, who wrote a letter to a bunch of churches that he started uh, in the Roman province of Galatia. And in this letter, he, he writes to predominantly Jewish Christians about how they don't really need to obey the Old Testament law anymore, as some of their pastors and leaders were telling them to. They didn't need to get circumcised anymore. They didn't need to obey the Sabbath anymore. They didn't need to pay any attention to Old Testament dietary restrictions anymore. That's what he's writing to the Galatians. And they don't need to do all that anymore. They can if they want, but they don't need to do that anymore because Jesus has fulfilled the law. He's rendered it obsolete in the word of the, Old Test of the book of Hebrews. But also, they don't need to obey the law anymore because God has made a new way for us to know right and wrong, a new way for us to follow his will and live righteous lives. That new way is the what? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what Paul writes to us about in the book of Galatians. The Holy Spirit is God's invisible presence sent from heaven to work in our lives and conform us uh, to the image of Christ. That's who the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does. Invisible presence of God who comes down from heaven to work in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. And as we walk in the Spirit, and as we live in the Spirit, 
And as we breathe in the Spirit, the Spirit produces all sorts of good things in our lives, otherwise known as the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul lists out an exa- gives us a list of examples of good things that the, that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And that's sort of our theme verse for the series. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the types of things that God produces in the lives of people who are open to his power and his strength. Now, what we're doing during the series is we're sort of picking up each one of those fruit, looking at it, figuring out what it is, and we're talking about how we can cultivate more of that in our lives. Last week, we started with the first fruit. Remember which one that was? Love. This week, we're going to get a little mixed up. We're not going to go by order here. We're going to mix the fruit salad, you might say. (laughs) And we're going to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, and we're going to talk about the sixth fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of goodness. Fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Now, frequently in the New Testament, the author tells us to live lives of goodness. In the book of Thessalonians, Paul prays that by God's power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. In 2 Peter, the author tells us to make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To the Ephesians, the apostle writes that we should live as children of the light, which consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Also in Ephesians, Paul explains that goodness was the very reason we were created and saved as God's people, to live good lives, doing good works. As he says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God's people should be good people, filled with goodness, doing good work. This was the very reason God saved us in the first place. And the reason that we should be good people, filled with goodness, doing good deeds, It's because that's who God himself is. God is a good God. People who follow a good God should reflect his goodness. The psalmist writes in Psalm 31, Oh, how great is your goodness, which you bestow in the sight of men. Writes in Psalm 145, we celebrate your abundant goodness. Goodness is a defining characteristic of God himself. Maybe you remember the story way back in the Old Testament of the book of Exodus. Moses, an early leader of the Israelites, asks to see God. Remember this story? He asks to see God. God says, no, I can't show you myself because what will happen? You'll die. Anybody who sees God will die. But here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to show you the part of me that you can see without dying. I'm going to show you my goodness. I will make my goodness pass before you. That's the part of God that God wanted Moses to see. This is who I am. I'm a good God. But God is not just good in who he is. God is also good in what he does. The author of 1 Chronicles writes, the Lord will do what is good. That's what he does. He does what is good. God is also good in how he blesses his people. Nehemiah records that God's people ate to the full, were well nourished. They reveled in the Lord's great goodness. And God's goodness can be seen in the creation in which we live in the book of Genesis. After God created all the heavens and the earth, he sat back, he looked at it all. What did he say? This is good. It's good what I've just done. I'm a good God. I do good things. So we are called to goodness because God is good. We are to be like him. But in my mind, this raises two questions. First question, what does that mean? What is goodness? What is good anyway? This is actually a surprisingly difficult question. What is good? Philosophers remind us that good is relative What's good for me may not necessarily be good for you. But even beyond that, the word good is such a big term. It's hard to know. It's very slippery. It's hard to know what exactly we're talking about. I mean, we, you, we use the word good like 50 times a day with all sorts of meanings. That's a good boy. Good job. He's got a good reputation. He's a good man. All those terms have different shades of meaning. What exactly are we talking about here? I looked up the word good in the dictionary. Seven separate meanings. Seven separate definitions. Good can mean morally excellent, satisfactory in quality, right or proper, well-behaved, kind, honorable, worthy. Good can mean practically anything. The word good is used 600 times in the Bible, but it's used in so many different ways it's hard to actually pin down what we're even talking about. It reminds me of the opening song from the musical, 
your good man, Charlie Brown. This is my musical reference for the morning. Would you like me to sing it for you? I'll spare you. Oh, what the heck? You're a good man, Charlie Brown. All right, that's what we'll do. Charlie's friends and family are dancing around and singing how good of a man he is. And as he sings to the audience, a good man, yes, but I confess, I don't know what they mean. What does it mean when we talk about God's goodness? What does it mean when we talk about being a good man? Uh, if you remember Hudson Davis, anybody remember Hudson Davis? He's a longtime rooftopper here. Went here uh, several years ago for a long time until he and his wife, Rachel, went off to the mission field a few years ago. Well, Hudson was a good friend of mine. Whenever I called him on his phone, here's how his voicemail went. Maybe you remember this if you ever called him. Hi, this is Hudson. Not here right now. Leave a message, your name, your number. I'll get back to you. And remember, God is good. That was his voicemail message. And remember, God is good. He would say it like that too. Remember, God is good. Well, what does that mean? I always wanted to ask him, that's, that's great, what does it mean? Now he took the answer with him to the mission field. <laughs> what does it really mean to be good? Well, theologians and linguists will admit that good is a hard word to pin down. It is an all-encompassing word that means an awful lot. But in an effort to be as helpful and specific as I can this morning, here's I'm going to go ahead and define the word. And actually, I'm not going to go ahead and define it myself. I'm just going to let God define it for us from the prophet Micah. In the Old Testament, as the prophet Micah writes to people who may have been wondering what the word good really means as we are this morning, he writes this, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what it means to be good. He has shown you. He has shown us what it means to be good. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God, to work for justice in the world, to extend mercy and forgiveness to people who need it, to walk humbly with God, dependent on him. That's what it means to be good. To be good means to work at the food pantry. To be good means to forgive other people. To be good means to dependent and humble before the Lord. That's what we could define good all you want, seven definitions or not. But at least in biblical sense, that's what we're talking about. Living lives of justice, mercy, humility, and obedience. But that brings up my second question here. My second question is this. Is that even possible? Is it even really possible to be good? You might think, yeah, of course it is. But as much as the Bible insists that God's people should live lives of goodness, the Bible insists something else. The Bible insists that that's impossible. As much as the Bible insists that we should live lives of goodness, the Bible also insists at the same time that that is fundamentally impossible. Why is it impossible? Because we are not good people. We are bad people. And bad people don't do good things. Bad people do bad things. As Jesus himself says, there is no one good but God alone. And as Paul writes to the Romans, there is no one who does good, not even one as he writes later in the same letter, I know that nothing good lives in me. So as much as the Bible says that our lives should be marked by goodness, the Bible also says that's impossible. There is nothing good in us. Now that might sound extreme. There is no one who does good, not even one. Oh, I don't know, Mother Teresa? Gandhi? My grandma? She's pretty good. There's nothing good living in me? Nothing? I'm a complete loser? Boy, I suspected so. Is this biblical proof? Well, this does sound extreme, and maybe Paul is exaggerating a bit to make a point. On the other hand, if he is exaggerating to make a point, he's not exaggerating by much. Because we are not nearly as good as we think we are. Every good deed we do falls far below the standards of God's goodness, so much so that anything good we do looks like absolute dookie in comparison to who he is as good. Even when we think we're doing good, we're often doing it with bad motives. And even as we attempt to do good, a lot of times we end up doing bad. Every time I try to cook dinner in an act of good service to my family, it ends up going terribly. I tried to make lasagna a few months ago. It went very badly. I really like garlic, so I put <laughs> lots of garlic in, 
I also put way too much cheese, too much sauce, I overcooked the noodles. What we ended up with was something like lasagna soup. We ate it with spoons. It was not good, it was very bad. Or my wife, Michelle, tried an art project last year. She saw something on print Pinterest. She decided to try, someone please shut down that website. <laughs> it is ruining marriages and families everywhere. She tried to decorate our refrigerator. The front of our refrigerator is an absolute mess. It's a disaster. So she tried to like organize and, and, and put like fam framed family pictures up there and a, a frame, like dry erase board, files for like uh, s school things and everything. And she got out the glue gun and she framed all these pictures and put up a big dry erase board for groceries. It was all good at first for like a half an hour. And then the frames like one by one just like clamored to the ground in the middle of the night, clang and the frames would get all dented, and then the glass would break, and we'd wake up, and we'd cut our feet on glass from the frames, and the, the door of the refrigerator, it actually kind of hits a, another door next to the refrigerator, so anytime it hit the door, everything would like get thrown across the dining room, so we'd have to go gather it up, and now it's all like thrown back up there, and it looks just as bad as it did originally. Whenever we try to do good, this is what happens. Things have a way of going bad, not to get political, but I think of the Iraq war and all the good intentions of our government in that effort. The good intentions we had to liberate the Iraqis, establish democracy in the Middle East, stand up to the evils of Muslim terrorists, all good things, right? So many of us supported that war. We were the good guys. Over 10 years later, what good have we done? The region is in turmoil, minorities are being slaughtered, stability is a pipe dream, so many lives lost as a result of our best intentions. Or to veer over to the other side of the political spectrum, just to be fair here, I think of the Affordable Care Act. All the president wanted to do was to give people affordable health coverage so they could lead longer, healthier, happier lives. Nothing wrong with that. That's all good. Years later, rates are shooting up, people are losing coverage, more people are dependent on the government instead of themselves, doctors are pulling out of Medicare and Medicaid, a country is more divided than ever. This is what happens when we try to do good, we do bad. Why? Because we're bad people. We're human beings, we can't do anything right. Even when we try to do things right, we do things wrong. And this is what Paul was talking about. We try to build a good marriage, we build a bad one. We try to be good neighbors, we're bad neighbors. We try to uh, be good students, we just end up flunking our tests. We try to be good Christians, we fail. We're not too good at being good. So what do we do then? Do we have any hope of adding to our faith goodness? Well, one of the things that I learned from Scripture on this topic is that being, doing good is possible, just difficult. It takes a lifetime of learning and study. The prophet Isaiah admits as much. As he writes, stop doing evil. Learn to do good. And the author of the Hebrews writes that the mature, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Doing good takes a lot of training and learning. I think we'd all agree with that. The longer I'm a husband, the better able I am to get this right. The longer I'm a pastor, the better able I am to figure out what is good in service to my people. The longer I work in the kitchen, the closer I get to an edible deal, dinner. Goodness can be learned. It's very possible to live good lives through discipline and understanding. That's why the Apostle John writes in his, his third letter, imitate what is good. If you see something good, imitate it. If you're a bad husband, and you know a good husband, do what they do. Bring home flowers. Say nice things. If you're a bad Christian, and you know a good Christian, imitate what they do. Go to church. Read the Bible. Pray. Tithe. Imitate what is good. Because goodness can be fleeting. And when you find it, you got to imitate it and you got to keep doing it. As Paul writes to the Romans, he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Good can be elusive. If you see it, cling it. If you have a good time volunteering at the food pantry, don't make it a one and done thing. 
She said it could be a one and done thing. Don't make it a one and done thing. Do it again. Cling to what is good. If you see something redemptive, something good in your children, focus on that, those evil, selfish, depraved people. (laughs) Cling to what is good. Find it. Cling to it. Goodness can be learned. Having said that, that's only true to a point. It's only true to a point that goodness can be learned because we still have a problem that deep down we are sinful people who do bad things because fundamentally that's who we are. The reason we do bad things is because we're bad people. It's that simple. Do you know why you're mean to your spouse? Because you're a mean person. Do you know why you don't give money away to people who need it more than you are, more than you do? Because you're a selfish person. Do you know why you watch so much television? Because you're a lazy person. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just a rude person. (laughs) But I'm also being honest. Bad people do bad things. And the solution isn't for bad people to try to do good things or better things. What's the solution? To become a good person. Because while bad people do bad things, good people do what? Good things. It's like what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew is he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So the way to do good isn't just to do good or imitate good or cling to what is good. The way to do good is to become good. That's what Jesus says. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Which brings us back to where we started. How does a bad person break good? How does God take a drug kingpin, or you or me, and turn us into chemistry teacher? The answer to that is not complicated. Bad people break good when they become followers of Jesus Christ. Bad people become good by giving our hearts and our minds and our bodies to Jesus Christ at every moment of our lives. Bad people break good when we repent of our sins, acknowledge our failures before God. Bad people break good when we believe that he died on the cross for our sins to save us from the consequence and the punishment that's do us. Bad people break good when we get baptized as a symbol of our forgiveness and God's cleansing of our sin. Bad people break good when we open up our lives to the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. As we do that, slowly, deliberately, even the course of, uh, over the course of a lifetime, God pours his spirit, his goodness, into us so that we can serve the world, our city, our families, our friends, with his goodness. It's like what Peter says, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his goodness. It is God's goodness, it is God's power that makes us good. It is God's goodness that allows us to live lives of justice, mercy, and obedience. We break good by giving our lives to Jesus and allowing him to fill us and guide us as we serve the people around us. So have you broken good yet in your life? Have you given your life over to Christ who died for your badness to pour his goodness into you? That's the only true lasting path to goodness in your life. Have you taken it? Let's pray.